Good afternoon and welcome to the Mixed Use Development in the Region webinar by Dr. Julian Roche. Um, I'm just going to hand over to him in just a few seconds, but before that, I'm just going to talk you through a few housekeeping rules that will help the afternoon go smoothly. Um, it's a very simple agenda, there's just five items, so I won't read it out to you, but this is what I need to make you aware of. Um, the slides and the recording of the webinar will be available to view and to download on the, our SlideShare page and our YouTube channel. We will send you the link to this um, in a follow-up email and we just ask that you give us a week to be able to get this to you, or up to a week. When the webinar finishes, a survey will pop up and I just ask that you give time to that, maybe a couple of minutes, just to give us your feedback, help us improve our services. And while you're listening to Dr. Julian, if you have any questions that you think of, you'll notice a small question box at the bottom of the control panel. And if you type in your questions there, then Dr. Julian will answer your questions at the end. So thank you for being here, and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thanks very much indeed. Much, uh, much appreciated. Okay, I hope you're all looking at the, uh, the slide that says uh, what urban plan demands. Um, and we're just kicking this off by looking at the whole question of the modern mixed-use development, how it's come about, what it's for, what it might achieve, and then we'll go on to, to talk about what use it might have and what application it might have in this region. Now, it's not uh, easy in today's environment to be an urban planner. Indeed, there are those uh, in some of the modern urban planning movements who say that urban planning is pretty much dead. And that, uh, nobody can plan a city. Nobody can cope with all the complex decision-making that's actually required. Certainly, if you were going to try, you have a huge number of different variables that you have to consider. On the social side, you have widely disparate demographics for virtually every city, uh, and that process is accelerating. You have a diminishing number of people in each household, and hence more households, more mobile households as well. You have, obviously, as you all, I'm sure, know, you have age groups uh, which are very different in their structure between OECD countries and uh, the developing world, including this part of the world. And you have an extraordinarily high and rising need for the three items in red, education, health, transportation. And we then have, in most cases, uh, semi-challenging or challenging issues about climate, not least because of climate change and all the other issues which you can see itemized under the physical environment. And you see those itemized there, you'll probably out of, out of view. And then from the economic point of view, we have to remember that urban planners essentially working for their political masters, uh, whether democratically elected or not, almost all of them have an interest in economic growth in a very conventional way. The efforts of uh, Inge Cowell in the 1990s at the United Nations Development Programme to change the way we measure the success of a society, and change away from gross domestic product, away to more environmentally sensitive and socially conscious measures of progress, have, it has to be said, been a complete failure. Uh, and so urban planners are charged, for the most part, with maximizing the economic potential of the city in which they work. So they have a vision about where that city is going to go. We all have seen them, Dubai 2020 or 2030, Abu Dhabi, uh, and others have these similar. London has exactly the same. They're good starting points in analyzing uh, the way that a city is going to go to look at the vision. And it's also interesting to look back, by the way, and see how far any of these visions have actually achieved uh, what they set out to do. And then you have the fundamental economic drivers, so London, the city of London, of course, the service industries. Uh, you have tourism, you have all the other industries that make cities work, and the way that planners have to think about what infrastructure they've got. And of course, all of this in the context of a 
budget. And <clears throat> the consequence of this rapid growth is that on occasion uh, we find that the rate of growth of population and of uh, profitable economic activity considerably exceeds the ability of the city and the financing of the city to be able to provide the transportation and the infrastructure that we really want. And if you go to the developing world, you find that in a massive quantity, Bangkok is an excellent example, huge amount of congestion, Manila is another example of a city that's got that. And then you look on other, other cases and you find there's quite a lot of efficient transportation and infrastructure, very well planned. And in places like Dubai, you see a, an exercise in what you might describe as catch-up uh, in the provision of the Dubai Metro and um, water transport and a whole lot of other stuff. But you've still got considerable congestion problems. And on top of that, you have an environmental consideration which says that uh, all these very conventional modes of transport and so forth are creating a considerable amount of environmental damage. Um, and environmental quality is one of those things that the EIU takes into consideration in its annual livability surveys. So a very mixed and very difficult picture for the urban planner that they confront. And what sort of solutions do we potentially have? I'm just waiting for the next slide to come up. Oh, here we go. Okay, so one potential solution to the problem, which has been identified in the United States and in the West for some 20 years or so, but which has now gained a lot of credibility, a lot of traction elsewhere in the world, is to say that the problems with cities is that they grew up following Frank Lloyd White rather than following Corbusier. In other words, they were all modelled around the vision that one might call the white picket fence view of how a city ought to be. And the white picket fence view of how a city ought to be uh, revolves around a number of core, largely theoretical concepts which were applied fairly systematically in the United States in particular, but not just in the United States, in the UK and elsewhere in the early part of last century. It's probably worthwhile our analyzing what those were. So the automobile is absolutely key. Commuting becomes part of that, that concept. The backyard, uh, as it's called in Australia, so single story properties uh, with fencing, the picket fence, uh, everyone having their own isolated uh, nuclear family usually revolving around the man going to work and the woman staying at home, 2.2 uh, children, local school, and the whole collected uh, metaphors that go with that. Now, just to describe that indicates just how implausible that is, really, uh, in the context of the 21st century. And without going through the socioeconomic and the uh, sociological deconstruction of that, uh, it's perfectly obvious, I think, that in an environmentally conscious and a more uh, fissiparous society, the 21st century, there's a lot to be criticised in the Frank Lloyd Wright approach and a lot to be said for the idea of a city in the sky, uh, as Corbusier would put it, and certainly something um, that is much more localised. So hence you see here the idea of the new urbanism. So an enormous stress in the West on the idea of the walkable neighbourhood. Now you can see both from the missing you in neighbour and from the walkable bit uh, that we are talking here about a Western environment in which zero expenditure is being placed on making the neighbourhood walkable, uh, apart from security, of course. It's no use walking from place to place if you're going to get mucked, and that's that's a problem with the new urbanism in the United States. Uh, but uh, places like Chicago and so forth. But certainly, I think immediately we have a concern um, about the question of its applicability in this part of the world when we talk about the walkable neighbourhood. Maybe we can solve that, uh, but it's an issue for us to to address. The next thing we, we look at in the context of the new urbanism is to say if you're trying to attack 
the Frank Lloyd Wright concept, then what you require is to reduce the time that people spend transiting from their place of work uh, back to where they live and vice versa. And in a society where an increasingly small percentage of the economy is direct, uh, of working people's time is directed towards primary, primary industries or even secondary manufacturing, and an increasing percentage of what people do is related to office-related activities of a huge variety. The opportunity exists to create what we call mixed use. Uh, in other words, getting, getting people to work and live in close proximity to one another. And there's more to it than that. I mean, the new urbanism stew uh, involves more than that. The, the street networks have to be closely connected uh, so that it's easy to move around. You have to increase the density dramatically over what you might find in Emirates Heights or, or any other, even Dubai Marina, but getting close with Dubai Marina, that sort of density. Uh, you've got to build, according to the new urbanism, and you, you will notice the, uh, the humanistic approach that dominates here. You've got to build on a human scale, so you're trying to create a community, uh, which reminds me of uh, Mazel Fatame's efforts. Uh, in the uh, waterfront development just north of Beirut, where there was uh, exactly that, a human scale development around a marina which was aimed at trying to produce a community. And, and also a range of, uh, of housing um, that will, will serve a wide range of, uh, of different uh, types of, of communities. Um, and I think those are the the key ingredients, although we would also add to that, uh, regional planning, uh, which is also part of the, uh, of the whole exercise. So that's what the new urbanism has been, and that's the way it's developed in the West. And as part of it, you can see fairly clearly what flows from that is that there's an emphasis on creating cities and environments that tick all the boxes and the boxes include uh, lead and the low use of carbon uh, they involve uh, and you can see this example from malaysia malaysia's had a lot of success um, not easy success but they are getting success uh, in the development of cyber giant and future dryer uh, where they'd be moving communities out and creating technological hubs in the case of CyberDryer and administrative hubs in the case of PewterDryer. And all of this has been done along the line of the high-speed train route um, out to the airport, which initially uh, was regarded as a, a wild card uh, because it's quite a long route and, and the airport was built, the new airport was built a long way away uh, from the centre. But the objective all along in this uh, was to create uh, a mixed-use, uh, internally consistent set of developments, which at the same time uh, were going to um, tick all the boxes so far as energy and renewable, uh, renewable uh, activities, uh, public transport rather than private transport, efficient use of, uh, of waste and water activities, uh, communications and technology uh, consistency, which of course has been improved greatly by the existence of, of wireless, um, and the creation of this sort of uh, urban environment and community. So that's what's being done uh, in the case of, of Malaysia and, and elsewhere. And for the typical mixed-use development, and we're talking now at the moment still about the concept of, of new urbanism, there are a number of crucial design issues that the architects and the developers who've pushed successful mixed-use developments have concentrated upon. They have organized around the pedestrian rather than organized around the vehicles. So the mixed-use development becomes isolated from the conventional automobile uh, commuting community and provides its automobile uh, parking on the edge of the mixed-use development. Once you get into the mixed-use development and a, a very early but extremely successful version of this, and although now showing its age, is the Barbican in London, uh, which was exactly this process and actually had the, the raised walkways 
uh, where pedestrians were wandering around above the traffic um, at, uh, at level one, and a lot of the parking was put in at level zero, uh, and the buildings started at level one. It's quite an impressive design. Um, but it is interesting to note, of course, that it's not a design that ended up being copied to any substantial degree. It became rather an elite exercise in its own right and continues, by the way, uh, to be to command considerable prices, although perhaps not the same sort of premium prices that it used to 40 or 50 years ago when it was stunningly innovative. Street connectivity, of course, uh, that, that's, that's vital. You want to make sure that everything lives together and sits together. And of course, linked to this is providing adequate retail. Uh, to making sure that people have access to the sort of community retail that they want to see. I could have added that on, on the slides here. As of the time, has done that in, uh, in Beirut, uh, making sure that you have your community shops. Uh, you need to make sure your research, and of course all these mixed-use developments, success rely on effective research and getting this balance right uh, between the different ingredients of the mixed-use, the, uh, the office component, the retail component, and the living component. And then you've got crime prevention. If you're going to get people wandering around the streets, uh, you've got to make sure that they're safe in doing so. And that means that you've got to have no dark corners um, and uh, areas where people can get into trouble. Um, public spaces are also extremely important. We see them inside the malls here in the Middle East, but uh, in the West, public spaces have become extremely important. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if by this point, you're beginning to wonder whether any of this has any direct relevance to this part of the world at all. This is all uh, a function of, of Western concepts which may not be translatable. And I'm not here to preach. I'm not here to say that this necessarily will work. And I certainly think, and we're going to discuss this a little later on, but I certainly think that there's going to be a need for significant adaption of this model uh, if it starts to come forward and starts to get promoted in this part of the world. And then, of course, you must make sure that we've got efficient land use. Governments generally, um, city governments and localities, are really quite fond of these mixed-use developments. Why? Because they're much more intensive in terms of their land use, and therefore, per meter square, they generate much higher uh, city taxes um, than conventional developments of one variety or another. And particularly, of course, we must remember that mixed-use developments may, in some cases, involve vertical mixed-use. That is not just horizontal where you share out the use around the land uh, uh, that you're using. But also vertical mixed use has happened, for example, in Brisbane in Australia, where you have, and of course the Burj Khalifa, which is an excellent example of a mixed use development all in its own right, uh, where you have part of the, of the development utilised for one thing, typically a hotel, another part used for apartments, another part used for retail, and still a further part used for offices and so forth. And that's, that's the, uh, the, the vertical aspect of this, all of which makes for very efficient land use. But at the same time, the new urbanism wants to pull it all down and say you should build this on a human scale design. And what that means is that there is, in fact, an internal tension within the mixed use movement between the verticals uh, and the horizontals. The people who want to build on a small scale who don't want to think about this as a fundamentally commercial exercise and those who want to think about using tower blocks in a multi-use sense uh, in the Brisbane example and in the Dubai example, uh, which is a very different approach to mixed use. All right, so what is clear about all of this is that we have to have planning, and this is just a, a, a small example of the sort of indicative time scale uh, that's required for any of these planning exercises, but you can see it's relatively short. And, and if you have a relatively short time scale, what this means is that all the planning exercise on the developer's part really needs to be done before you meet the planning committee. Everything needs to be in place. And that means the very difficult exercise of organizing the relative balance between the different elements of the mixed-use development needs to be there before. Now, I open up this for, for your general consideration. Certainly in all the seminars I've been conducting recently, there's been a real sea change. This year, I think, there's been a sea change in terms of people's perception about the way that real estate is going to go over the next 20 or 30 years. And I can describe them, let's say, it's, it's pre-online and post-online. The, the pre-online view really was that mixed-use developments have their place, uh, they may be appropriate for redevelopment of small spaces, uh, they are niche product development of one variety or another, they may be motivated by social considerations, uh, they may be appropriate for uh, 
introducing low-cost housing, for example, into an urban development that's a need for a certain amount of, of retail. They may have their appropriate place in, uh, in individual projects like the Waterfront or, or Business Bay or Burj Khalifa, but they're not the dominant form uh, of real estate construction which is going to go forward. We are still going to be uh, in a world in which uh, re retail gets planned as malls, residential gets planned as large estates, uh, or tower blocks which are exclusively residential, uh, industrial and light industrial gets its own zoning and its own areas of course, um, and, and finally that, uh, that offices get constructed as tower blocks. Now what I'm noticing in seminars that I'm conducting this year, and I'm not quite yet at the point of being confident enough to say that there is a consensus view about this, but I'm undoubtedly detecting a changing view. Um, and that is to suggest that that model, that traditional flank, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, pre-internet, pre-online model of the way that, that real estate is going to work over the next X number of years may have had its day. And that we may now start to recognize that people are, really will, start to work from home to a much larger degree, that people really will be conducting online meetings. We are, after all, doing so right at the moment. And this is, uh, I think I'm correct in saying, show the first year in which Informers launched these uh, online webinars. Why now? Why is it happening now? Why all over the world, not just, not just here, I can assure you, when I spend a lot of my time traveling worldwide, but this year, a completely new force has entered uh, every business that I come across in respect of moving things online to a much larger degree. And undoubtedly the force behind this is cost. That moving people around the world and moving people from place to place um, and establishing large offices and so forth is an expensive business. Let me give you just one statistic on this one, which has always struck me. I went to a think tank in London, we're talking about costs there. And they said that 40% of their time was spent raising money for themselves. So effectively, if you divide up the week into five working days, two of those five days were spent raising the money just so they could carry on existing. And of their costs, they said, half roughly were salaries, which is a think tank we're talking about, so apart from IT, virtually no capex. And the other half was salaries, rent and salaries. So my math says that that means that every Monday or every Tuesday, whatever day you want to say, they work for the landlord. You take the landlord out of that equation and they automatically become 20% more effective in what they do, minus whatever synergy they get by all being in the place, same place at the same time. And I was at a university, I won't say which one it was, but a university in the UK, uh, very recently, delivering a seminar, and I noticed that it was term time. Uh, and I noticed that there were no students around, or virtually no students around. So I asked people, where are all the students? And they said, oh, well, um, they don't come anymore. I said, why? Oh, well, um, the lecturers are now required to um, podcast all their lectures. And all the students are required to do is to click online and download the lecture and demonstrate that they have downloaded They don't need physically to turn up to the lecture anymore. I see, I said. So what use is there for the campus? Oh, they said, um, what we understand is the Estates Department is planning to get rid of the campus in the next 10 years. Now just have a think about that. That's a perfectly respectable UK university stopping having a physical campus, at least for all its social science departments, altogether. And that's quite a significant change. What's going to happen to the campus? What's going to happen to the, uh, to the properties there? What are they going to do with it all? Well, obviously, uh, one thing they are thinking of doing with it is, uh, is using the residential for, for long-term residential. Uh, they keep the, the administrative facilities there uh, for, for science because they can't get rid of those, but they may share those with other science facilities around the world. It's a very different vision of how a university might be and a very different vision about how you look at real estate going forward. And just maybe we may be at the cusp of the largest single change in the way that real estate has been organized um, for 100, 200 years. What are the benefits? What does it look like when we organize ourselves? Well, in an ideal world, a mixed-use development with that right balance involves putting activities all together, reducing the quantities of people's need to travel, 
particularly reducing their reliance on the automobile, driving up the opportunity for public transport, making much nicer and more attractive town centres, making everything more secure, and generally bringing social, economic and environmental benefits all at the same time. Really quite a dramatic improvement all round. Now this is the point I, I wanted to make about the uh, relative benefit from government's point of view. And look at that, you see. Uh, there's the traditional Frank Lloyd Wright view of the world. Uh, there's your uh, 34 acres that's used up. Total property taxes, 6,500. Retail taxes per acre, 47,100. Absolutely no residents and very, very few jobs per acre in the traditional model. And, and US malls are just dying. Nobody goes to these places anymore. Why would you when you could order online? Alternatively, uh, downtown mixed use, uh, tiny amount of land used, huge amount of taxes coming in, uh, which is going to interest any government, including the government of Dubai or the government of Kuwait or anywhere else, and a massive number of jobs with people actually living in those areas and revitalizing the city centers in which they operate. Obviously, uh, considerably more attractive for everyone to, uh, to imagine. And a recent report from Grimley J.R. Eve uh, gave some really quite dramatic evidence of this actually happening in London. Uh, a staggering, something like 10% of the grade B and grade of, uh, C offices in London four or five years ago are not offices anymore. They've been converted to residential use. That's really quite dramatic. And if you look at, on the, uh, the left-hand side chart, you see popping up all over London these medium to small scale mixed-use developments, much smaller than we're accustomed to see in this part of the world. We're not talking about building cities here. We're absolutely not talking about building cities because they're reliant on the city outside for many of the strategic requirements, uh, whether it's the delivery of food or the delivery of raw materials or a number of other things. These are not self-contained cities. Uh, in the Saudi Arabian sense. It's not King Abdullah City we're building here. But we are building Google Village up in King's Cross. We are building Elephant and Castle Village and redeveloping an entire area and putting 45,000 people to live in an area where only 20,000 lived before and adding retail at a neighborhood level and adding office tower blocks and so forth into this exercise. There doesn't seem any doubt that development opportunities of this nature are occurring certainly uh, in the Londons, in the San Diegos and elsewhere. Question for us, the really big question for us, this is uh, traffic and the importance of analyzing traffic accurately in the whole exercise. You've got to get this right, uh, making sure that we analyze the peaks and the troughs and so forth. The really interesting for us, just moving through, forward through these, uh, this is how we would look at it, uh, using GIS uh, to help us understand how all of these things work. You see the, the different layers of the GIS techniques that we're creating here. When you build a mixed use like development like this, uh, and the, uh, the interconnected street systems that you plan using GIS. You get this wrong. You, know, you end up building a mixed-use development by the sea, for example, where everyone still needs to commute because you've not created enough jobs inside the mixed-use development, and you end up with people uh, being forced to, uh, to move around uh, in a way that's uh, unsatisfactory because they don't have sufficient transportation opportunities or uh, there's log jams or tramps or otherwise. But it's done properly. You see the whole thing being done neatly at a multi-layered approach to the number of people, where the streets are, how the land passing divides up, how high it is, and so forth, and, and where the land usage goes. There are a number of theoretical models of how mixed-use development actually ought to work. I haven't bothered including them in this uh, presentation. We can go and have a look at them in the urban planning literature. The really interesting question, of course, for us uh, is how it works for us. And I think the starting point for uh, considering this is the HBU aspect of all of this. Highest and best use, of course, has been uh, very much part of the traditional model that we've uh, always used for real estate. And the HBU criteria, probably many of you are familiar with this, what is physically possible on the site, uh, what is legally permissible on the site, which is a dependence on zoning, um, and what is financial uh, financially possible. And 
there are several examples of HPU analysis. Uh, Sherry was kind enough to send me a, a photograph of a particular building in Dubai, uh, which was one of the earliest office uh, and retail uh, developments, which was put up many, many years ago. Um, and that was considered for the possibility of redevelopment, but that redevelopment was eventually rejected uh, for financial reasons. Uh, many of you will have seen development HPUs uh, where it's been suggested for uh, particular types of development of being optimum in individual locations, uh, such as uh, Jeddah and so forth, where there have been gaps, and people have looked at one single use uh, that's being put onto that particular site. Optionality in the uh, development HPUs, absolutely all of these things uh, extend the scope of HPU, increasing the possibilities, so what can we do with the architects, uh, how do we redevelop, Broadgate for example in London being redeveloped, um, and then how do we work with our partners, whether they be government uh, or otherwise. Now, bringing all of this together and starting to talk about what I think really matters to us in the region, and that is how far does all of this give an opportunity in this region for the new urbanism to play a part and for mixed-use developments to, to exist? The first thing I would say is that I already have evidence from some of the largest of the real estate developers in this region that they are starting to think differently. And they're starting to think differently in countries like Egypt and the UAE and Kuwait and Bahrain. And they're starting to look to the new urbanism, they're starting to say, we need to develop on a smaller scale than we have done hitherto. We are not going to be building 5,000 luxury villas anymore in one place. We're not going to be putting our eggs in that basket in that way. We're not going to be becoming master developers as we have typically done and parceling out the, uh, the development for smaller developers to play in individual areas. We're not going to be in the city building exercise which is what we've been doing uh, in the past. We can change that and start to move across actually to constructing miniature cities, cities in miniature, mixed-use developments of the type that have become successful in Asia um, and in Europe and the United States. And they're going to work with government, so they're going to accept a measure perhaps of social housing, they're going to be encouraging the use of public transport. So it's going to be centered around, in the uh, transport-oriented development, the, the TOD approach, centered around a public transport hub, without which it's just a non-starter. It has to be public transport as, a, as a, an absolutely crucial building block for the successful mixed-use development, I would argue, especially in this region. But they're then going to go further. And they're going to say, and they're starting to talk about this, really talk about this, the interconnected buildings, so that the developer, as part of a developer contribution, creates an interconnectedness between towers, uh, between blocks, so that the climate disadvantages, which have typically stopped uh, walking as being a means of, of uh, getting around, uh, from one building to another in this, in this region, they drop away. Now, as soon as you start to imagine that the objection to walking between buildings in the heat drops away, and in Singapore you can see they've started to do this by going underground, that's not likely to happen here. In Singapore and Toronto, for opposite reasons, they've gone underground, but assuming that doesn't happen, as soon as you remove that, as soon as you start to say you will start to cover then the opportunity for creating a Western-style mixed-use development really opens itself up because you can live in one area, you can come down to the bottom, down to the area, you can collect your cup of coffee in the morning, you can walk across through a covered walkway uh, which is air-conditioned and protected, not very far, not an enormous long distance uh, across to your workplace uh, or other workplaces. Now, there are some big challenges with this. And I think many people are already aware of the tension between fluidity in the job market and the idea for creating a mixed-use development. 
it's marvelous to imagine my vision of, of living in a development uh, and, and stepping across to where you work. But what happens if you then get a job at the other side of town? So it is going to make sense only in an environment, I think, where you're going to accept a large quantity of people on relatively short leases, so far as residential is concerned, and possibly even relatively short leases, so far as commercial is concerned as well. Those people who are going to buy and going to settle in a given mixed-use development are, of course, those people who are either going to work there or work largely there um, and commute uh, perhaps to other countries or other developments elsewhere uh, uh, for specific purposes and so forth. So the hub in terms of the living criteria and of course all the other things that are going to go with that, the, the gyms, the swimming pools, uh, the, the rooftop gardens, the, uh, the growing of, of vegetables vertically or whatever it is that everyone wants to do, that's a New York speciality, uh, but that may well come here, so you have your own uh, individual activities. The branding of the, uh, of the individual development, so you become proud to live in the XYZ mixed use development uh, and so forth because you're next, you're rubbing shoulders with Merrill Lynch or you're rubbing shoulders with Barclays Bank or, or or whatever, whoever it happens to be, who has an office there, or a form of that. Uh, and the next step to that, I think, is how we deal with this whole question of the automobile and where we go with it. And this region has been in love with the automobile as much as, if not more, uh, than any other uh, region. Uh, and so it's going to be a difficult exercise in, in parting with that, uh, nevertheless. Uh, the attractions of being in such an environment where you do have good public transport and you can move to other hubs of this nature may result in a reduction in the number of people who want to drive from place to place. I, I know myself, I lived in Singapore for a couple of years and one of the great joys for me of living in Singapore was precisely the fact that I didn't have to own a car in that environment, but that was because taxis were cheap and plentiful. Uh, or as well as the fact that the public transport was perfectly effective and the fact that I was prepared to part with the climate. Nevertheless, in, uh, in Singapore now, uh, this interconnectedness of buildings, uh, the, the tentacles of interconnectedness are spreading throughout Singapore uh, and enabling people to connect up in, in what is certainly uh, one of the most advanced cities so far as uh, mixed-use development is concerned. Hong Kong is another very good example of that. And of course, there are all sorts of efficiencies that could be generated in this part of the world uh, from doing so. And government is likely to look favorably on all of these things because, of course, in the end, it reduces their infrastructure need. We started out by talking about the enormous pressures that governments are going to face all over the world uh, in respect of, of city planning because of their need to build all these expensive roads and expensive connections. Yes, public transport is extremely expensive, and that's, that's part of the problem. I'm looking at some rail costings at the moment, and they are millions of dollars per kilometer. Roads are an awful lot cheaper to build than, uh, than public transport, and that's a, that's a big factor uh, for the development of mixed use. But once you've got these things, once you've got the Dubai Metro, once you've got the, uh, uh, the, the Jeddah Metro, whatever it happens to be, then you can build your mixed use developments around the individual uh, metro stations that have been constructed. And we're starting to see that process with developers getting out. Look, not everybody gets this. Not everybody agrees with this. This is, this is the most contentious webinar that I've, I've ever presented, and possibly one of the most contentious ones that I will ever present. The evidence I've got is that there are developers that are taking this process seriously and really beginning to move ahead and actually thinking about doing so. Uh, I've also got plenty of evidence, particularly from Australia, uh, of, of a government and a populace with its head so firmly stuck in the sand that it's absolutely not prepared to think about anything other than the conventional view of the world. And where I live in Perth, um, the Los Angeles-like development of the city spreading north uh, 30 kilometers, 40 kilometers, now 60 kilometers from the city center with the, with the time taken to get from place to place increasing, increasing, increasing. Nobody is thinking beyond uh, the very conventional approach except for one or two small cases where people are trying to buck the trend uh, and think about constructing mixed use. We may be up for a transitionary period. I, I suspect we probably are. There is room in this part of the world for individual mixed use developments and very successful mixed use developments to occur. 
And as I've already pointed out, the Burj Khalifa is in fact one of them in prototypes. So we may see examples of that with individual towers, we may see examples of that with successful interconnected buildings and so forth, but we may not find it as the dominant mode uh, of real estate development going forward. But I am certainly uh, optimistic that mixed use development is here to stay. The best uh, case, the best practices of mixed use development in the West are certainly worth observing very carefully uh, and, and following and tracking. The new urbanism may not be entirely transplantable to this part of the world, but the pressures uh, and the, the both budgetary pressures and climate pressures and environmental pressures and so forth all together mean that this looks like a model that we should at the very least take very seriously as developers uh, going forward. Well, that's me done in terms of uh, looking at mixed use and, and its implications for the region. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, pass across and take any, uh, any questions that you might have on this uh, really quite exciting prospect for the transformation of real estate. Um, and the brightest note I can strike really is that all of this is a tremendous opportunity for developers potentially uh, over the next 20 or 30 years, both in this region and worldwide. Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, and I look forward to any questions that you have to ask. a few admin questions about um, uh, can you attend a recorded webinar, webinar and so forth? Um, I presume you can download the, uh, the recording, mm -hmm. can't you? Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll send a link to, the, uh, to you enabling you to download the recording uh, later. So that's, that's fine, we'll do that. So does anybody have any questions after, after this? It's, uh, or, or opinions for that matter? I'd be very happy to hear anybody's views about, um, about where, we would, uh, where we would go with this. Well, um, the, the, the question about what the expected rates of return might be um, on mixed-use developments by comparison to uh, residential developments is indeed a very interesting one. I, I think that successful mixed-use developments, of course, obviously all of this is confidential to the developers concerned, but successful mixed-use developments have achieved at least the same uh, level of return uh, as, the, uh, as the more conventional ones. And What's really important uh, about these developments is to get the phasing right. Uh, one of the reasons where, uh, one of the ways that people have gotten wrong um, is that they promised people that they're going to deliver them retail, uh, they're going to deliver them other benefits, and then they built the residential first, and then um, take a long time to actually uh, deliver the subsequent elements, and that's, that's certainly reduced the resale value and had a reputa ne negative reputational effect. So coordinating the planning and getting the phasing right is really, really important. Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? People's world, I think, what do you mean by make people's world smaller? I, I think there, there, is a, there is an issue. Uh, the question is whether, whether mixed use about would make people's world smaller if they don't travel from one place to another. No, I don't think so, because I don't think one's world gets bigger by moving from one's home to an office and back again every day. I don't think that makes one's world bigger. I think what make, makes one's world bigger is meeting people of many different cultures and many different, uh, uh, different approaches to life. And I think you do that by global travel, but you also do that by meeting people on the internet. And I, and I don't think that, that mixed-use developments unless they become ghettos, and I think that, that's a major concern that we have. Uh, if, if they become ghettos, then 
they will make people's world smaller because you'll only ever be talking to people who have the same race as you, uh, or the same religion as you, or the same culture as you, because all of you live in the same mixed-use development. So the Japanese people go and live in the Japanese um, office tower, they go and move work next door in the Japanese bank, um, and there is, a, there is a danger there that you could create that sort of, uh, that, that sort of a cultural ghetto. And I think that Singapore government's already had that problem and it's introduced very stringent regulations to stop people from doing that uh, by mandating certain requirements in terms of, uh, of, of the distribution of population. And I think that if the same thing were to occur in, uh, in this part of the world, governments would have to also have to be fairly brutal about preventing that from happening. But there is a risk, I, I certainly grant there is a risk. Uh, that's happened in the Lebanon as well, uh, where development's being put up effectively only for Lebanese people, which is um, somewhat narrow-minded, to say the least, yes. Anybody else got any questions? By all means, ask. You know, so. All right. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, that's fine. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for listening. Um, if there's anything that comms up further, I'm sure you can get in touch with uh, Lynn Former and them. I'll always be happy to answer anybody's queries um, if they want to get in touch with me. But other than that, thank you all uh, for participating in the webinar.